Real quick here, this video is part of a Jack Marathon, so I recommend that you first start this series of videos by watching my Jack and Daxter review. Anyway, Jack 3 is a game I really knew nothing about before I played it, which left me curious to see if the game would change up the gameplay again, or if it would build upon the gameplay set up in Jack 2. Well, why don't we find out together to see if Jack 3 is worth playing. The story of the game picks up about a year after the last game. It turns out, with Baron Praxis dead, the city ends up getting attacked by robots and metalheads. A council member named Count Fieger ends up blaming Jack for the city's misfortune, and because of this, Jack gets banished to the wastelands. Accompanying Jack is his friend Daxter, as well as Pecker. The three of them spend a few hours wandering the desert, getting nowhere, until finally they all pass out due to heat exhaust. Thankfully though, they get rescued by a tribe of people living in the desert. The leader of the tribe, Deimos, welcomes Jack and Dexter to their city named Spargus. However, in order for them to become actual citizens, they will have to complete a series of challenges given to them by Deimos himself. And it's from here the story starts to lose its focus. I mean, first we meet some monks that live in Spargus who tell Jack that the world is ending because of the presence of some star. Later on, Ashlyn appears in the desert to try and bring Jack back to the city because apparently, Count Viger is now in charge and is doing a crap job at it. Eventually, Jack does go back to the city while still going back to Spargus from time to time to help aid Deimos when he needs it. But while in the city, Jack helps fight off the robots and metalheads who are for some reason still around and try to figure out who started the attack on the city in the first place. I'm sorry if that doesn't make much sense, but that's because it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me at the time when I first played the game. While writing this script, I have a tab open that's about the game's story to help remind me of what had happened in the game. Unfortunately though, it really hardly helps. While I wasn't a huge fan of Jack 2, I at least remember the story very well. Here though, things are all over the place and with very little focus. I mean, sure, later a bigger main goal is put into focus, but the journey to get there is just rather forgettable. Don't get the impression that this means I think the story is bad, cause I don't. I just find it to be quite the mixed bag and not very well told. There are some good things to the story though, and that would be the characters. Jack is for the most part the same as he was in the previous game, a decent main character who I don't really hate, but I also don't really love. He's all around just okay. Honestly, it's the other characters he interacts with that end up leaving more of an impression for me. Daxter is still a smart-mouthed ocel who I don't find as funny as in Jack 2, but he's still rather likable here. There are some more forgettable side characters as well, like the monks and some dude who hates Jack and Spargus. I forget his name, but uh, I'm still not a huge fan of Torn. Returning characters like Sig on the other hand are great. Sig is just the same as he was before, an upbeat soldier type who's willing to go to almost any length to stop the villains and help Jack, and he's just great. Ashlyn is given more of a focus since now she's the one who pretty much ends up running Haven City and is a good ally with Jack. The two seem to have some kind of romance in this game, which to me just seemed to be out of place since they really didn't have much of a relationship set up in the last game. I don't mind it though. It just seems unnecessary to me. Speaking of romances, we have Tess, who ends up getting much more of a personality this time. Tess is quite upbeat and has a love for modifying weapons. Strangely enough, the relationship between her and Daxter is actually kinda sweet. The two really do seem to care about each other and work off one another rather well. I still don't really get the bestiality thing, but hey, whatever makes them happy, I guess. Unfortunately, Samos and Kira don't get a whole lot of attention this time, and are just kinda there in the background. It's disappointing to me, as I like these characters. They've been with us since the beginning of the series, and now they're just kinda forgotten. Admittedly, Samos gets a little more attention, but I just wish both of them played a bigger part of the story. The absolute highlight of the game's characters for me though would have to be Deimos. I genuinely like Deimos. He's a great leader for his people as he tries to keep a level head in hard situations and slowly starts to grow a great deal of respect for Jack. The moments when Jack and Deimos are talking or helping each other are honestly my favorite moments and are the most memorable moments in the game for me. They work off each other pretty well and you really get a sense that Deimos has been through a lot and understands what it means to be a leader, having to make hard decisions and willing to protect everyone as best he can. I just wish these two had some more time together, and honestly that Spargus was the only focus in the game. Count Viger, on the other hand, kinda sucks. 
he doesn't have much of a presence in the game, which for me made him feel much less like a villain. And honestly, he didn't show up too much in the game either. Maybe it's just me, but he definitely feels like a villain who was just thrown into the game, and wasn't someone that they had thought out more, or at least someone they weren't thinking about during Jack 2. There is another villain in the game, but we'll talk about that when we get to the spoiler section. Much like the rest of the Jack games, the presentation is still pretty great. Character models are nicely detailed and have some smooth animations. The characters themselves are well voiced, with the only one that was a little off for me at first would have to be Damus, but it eventually grew on me. Once again, I just can't remember the music all that well. However, going back to listen to the soundtrack, it is still some pretty good music. But what about the gameplay? Is it another drastic change like in Jack 2? Well, actually no. It's for the most part the same as Jack 2. This time though, we have two different open worlds to explore. First, we have the Wastelands, which is this huge open desert area where you can really notice the game's natural day and night cycle. I still like this day and night cycle, mostly because I really enjoy traveling through the desert at night. I don't know why, but I really like night desert levels. There's something about a looming moon over a vast desert landscape that I just can't help but to find really appealing. While it is a desert, there are few areas that do feel quite distinct from one another, like the waterfall, destroyed ruins, and small oasis. Unfortunately though, there aren't very many places you can go to while in the wastelands. Most of the time you'll be driving around the desert, visiting the Precursor Ruins, or Spargus. To be fair though, the ruins and Spargus are cool locations. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. Wait, what do you mean drive around the desert? Yes, well, as it turns out, as Jack progresses through the game, he will get different cars to use in the wasteland. For the most part, I wouldn't say there's a huge difference between the cars, with the exception of the Dune Hopper. The Dune Hopper is actually my favorite since it shoots out these small bombs, and it's great for jumping over large gaps, which is actually rather helpful. While you're driving around the wastelands, you will often get attacked by other people in their own cars who will spawn in random locations. They usually don't get in the way too much, plus killing them will give you a turbo booster which is quite nice. My only problem is controlling these cars. For the most part, they're fine and feel kind of natural. It's just that they sometimes make these unnecessarily sharp turns at weird times, and often you will find yourself fighting against awkward terrain. While I'm not particularly huge on the desert driving missions, I would say that they are still a lot better than the hover car missions in Jack 2, and only a few of the missions gave me too hard of a time. Yeah, just like in Jack 2, you'll progress through the game by completing missions, which you'll have to get to by traveling around the two open worlds. And once again, there is a mini-map that lets you know where the next mission is, and it's still a feature I find to be pretty helpful. We'll talk about missions a little later on. For now, let's talk about Spargus, the city you can visit in the wastelands. Spargus has a pretty nice design to me. It's just unfortunate that you can't really do much in the city. What I like best about Spargus though are the Leapers. Leapers are these lizard-like creatures you can ride who remind me a lot of Flut Flut. Personally, I still like Flut Flut more, but the Leapers are still pretty great and a nice substitute. They control rather well and have an okay biting attack and a really nice flutter jump. Of all the things you can ride in the game, Leapers are by far my favorite, and I enjoy every moment I get to ride them. Let's not forget that we do have another open world here in this game, and that one would be Haven. City. Things have changed in Haven City. First off, it's much smaller compared to Jack 2, and there are a few areas that look completely different as well. Sure, some of the areas from before look quite similar, with the main difference being that they look beat up and worn down. These new areas, though, are pretty cool, like this inner city looking section and the dark corrupt forest area, which is easily my favorite. Much like before, you can use a hoverboard to get around, but honestly, this time around, the hover cars are actually better. Don't get confused here, they still don't control real well, but the city has a more simple layout, and now you won't get attacked by Crimson Guards. Walking around the city, there are these new Crimson Guards who will actually start fighting with metalheads and robots in the more rundown sections of the city, and will for the most part leave you alone. I actually find it pretty cool to see these battles taking place. It really helps reinforce the fact that the city is out of balance. What also makes the hover cars a better option is that there's much less traffic, so you won't be running into other people too often. Just like in the last game though, there really aren't any places to visit and explore in the city. Which still leaves me confused as to why these games were made with such open worlds. 
but since Night of the Open Worlds are too large, it becomes less distracting for me. Sure, there are still those challenge spots you can find throughout the two worlds that will award you with precursor orbs, but all these do is unlock secrets, which is fine, but I never really went out of my way for them. Plus, you're gonna need metalhead skulls to activate the challenges, and these challenges themselves really aren't all that great. Why don't we move on to the missions, since those are the main focus of the game. Like I had mentioned, there are driving missions in the game that typically have you driving through some rings or picking things up in the desert. I don't find these to be all that fun, but they're also not too bad they're manageable. This time around, many of the missions are action platforming missions, which is great as these are by far the most fun missions in the game. These will range from exploring precursor ruins, making your way through a worn down mining site, or navigating through a war factory. The combination of good platforming and an improved gun system make these some really fun sections to me. So yes, guns make a return, those being the red scattergun, yellow blaster, blue Vulcan fury, and the purple peacemaker, which you can easily switch between by pressing one of the four directional buttons. Yeah, it kinda sucks that the guns still rely on auto-aim that isn't all that good as I'd like it to be, but guns now do get upgrades. These upgrades greatly change how you use each gun. I mean, the scatter gun will get this wave mod that's just okay, it's only really useful if you can get it really charged up, and it will also get this grenade launcher mod that's actually really useful throughout the game. The Peacemaker is still a gun you want to save for special occasions, especially since now it gets an upgrade that can cause the enemies to float and be vulnerable for a certain amount of time, as well as getting a mod that is pretty much a massive bomb that takes a lot of ammo. While I still find the basic Vulcan Fury to have the poorest auto-aim, the electrical mod it gets is okay, but not one I use too often, while the laser mod it gets, however, is very awesome as it shoots out multiple bullets that hone in on one enemy, giving the gun some of the best auto-aim. Then there's my ever so reliable blaster, which gets a pretty killer gyro upgrade that shoots out a disc that rapidly fires at nearby enemies. Plus, there's a ricochet upgrade that makes bullets, well, ricochet off of enemies and surfaces. This upgrade combined with an in-air shooting spin attack is just amazing, and it just makes me love this attack so much more. Getting these weapon upgrades as you play through the game really helps give a sense of Jack getting stronger, and helps with the progression of the game. Not only can you get these weapon upgrades, but you will also get pieces of armor that will improve Jack's health, another feature I actually really like believe it or not, but there are more ways for Jack to get stronger. I am, of course, talking about Dark and Light Jack. Dark Jack returns, and is actually much more useful this time around. Once again, Dark Jack is useful for taking out lots of enemies since he's so strong when in this mode. Plus, he gets a pretty great ground pound attack that sure, takes all his dark energy, but does massive damage to surrounding enemies. Dark Jack also gets some new abilities, like being able to turn invisible and shoot out an energy ball that is used for destroying certain walls. These new abilities really help make Dark Jack much more useful, and some of these skills are even needed in certain missions. Then we have Light Jack, who gets his own new abilities, like being able to slow down time or creating a temporary shield. Light Jack will also get these wings that give him some extra long jumps, which is a pretty cool idea. Unfortunately though, it's a bit awkward to use, and isn't used too often either. By far though, the best ability Light Jack gets is the ability to heal. Holy crap, this is such a useful skill, and is easily my favorite thing introduced in the game. Given Jack the ability to heal himself makes some of the more frustrating missions much less taxing, especially since checkpoints can still be poorly placed in this game. You can use Dark and Light Jack by collecting Dark and Light Eco, which you get from boxes, enemies, and even vents sometimes. Thankfully, it doesn't take a whole lot of eco to fill up your yin and yang gauges, and even then, you don't need them fully filled in order to use some of the skills. Because of this, I actually use Dark and Light Jack more often than I thought I would, considering that I almost never use Dark Jack and Jack 2. Aside from that, there are a few random missions that are, for the most part, pretty okay. Sure, some like this turn section aren't all that great, but not too many of the missions ever got too frustrating as they did in the last game, and I actually ended up enjoying more of them this time around. Keep in mind that there are still some challenging missions, 
but the difficulty curve this time has a much better gradual and consistent increase to it. It's that time when we start talking about spoilers, so if you want to avoid the game's ending, please skip ahead to the time shown now. Alright, so remember when I said that there was another villain in the game? Well, it turns out to be Errol himself. Yes, Errol has in fact returned, and he is now the main villain. And he kinda still sucks. To be completely honest, I had forgotten who Earl was when I was playing through the game, and I had played the game right after playing Jack 2. So yeah, Errol for me is still a very forgettable villain. Plus, I just don't know what his motivations were this time around. Errol, I guess, was communicating with these dark creatures who were on the star, which was actually a spaceship that they wanted to use to destroy the world, I think? Yeah, sorry if that's a bit confusing, but like I said, the story lacks a strong focus. Either way though, Deimos and Jack team up for one last time to stop the dark creatures, but in doing so, Deimos ends up getting killed, and we learn that he was in fact Jack's father. It's this particular moment that made me wish that these two had some more scenes together, as well yes, this is a very predictable twist, it still would have had more weight to it if Jack and Deimos just had some more time with each other. It turns out that Count Viger was the one who separated Jack from his father, which to me served no purpose and felt really shoehorned in just to make him hateable. It wasn't very well set up and his motivations are just stupid and convoluted, as it turns out he wanted to reach the planet's to meet with the Precursors and to become one of them. Though the gag of the Precursors actually being ossels is one that I kinda like. Anyway, Jack and Dexter save the world, the Precursors thank Jack and turn Tess into an ossel, which I guess makes their relationship a little less weird since now they're both elf people turned into furry creatures who can live happily together, uh, I guess. The Precursors offer Jack who I think is Mar, maybe? I don't know, it wasn't very clear to me. Anywho, they offer him a chance to travel with them, but he refuses and decides to stay with his friend Daxter. It's an okay ending. Nothing special, but eh, it works. The last few missions of the game are rather difficult, and yeah, I really don't like the last driving mission as it's very awkward and it takes for fucking ever. As for the final boss, well, it's an alright fight if a bit easy. So would I recommend Jack 3? Uh, sure, it's a decent game. Don't get me wrong, there are things here that I really like, such as smaller open worlds, more action platforming missions, weapon upgrades, and I really like the new dark and light Jack skills. For the most part, I really enjoyed playing this game. That being said though, I didn't really love the game. Okay, you know, writing this out, I will admit I am being rather difficult here. It's a very well put together game that works greatly for an action adventure experience, and if that's something that you like, then you should absolutely give this game a try. Sure, the story isn't that great and there are some less than stellar missions, but for the most part, it's pretty fun. It's just not a game I personally go back to very often. We're not done yet though, as there are still two more games to go, so I'll see you guys next time when we talk about an interesting turn for the Jack series.